Um, she found out that she had had a grandchild while she was away. And what she'll say now is that she can't get rid of them. Um, so it's an amazing story. And uh, she also, by the way, is, she moved into our housing at the Times Square Hotel at 43rd and 8th pretty shortly thereafter. Um, and, and, and you could set your watch to it pretty much. She relapsed. Uh, but the supportive housing team was there to, to work with her. And she's, you know, it, it's, these things happen, right? You guys know this. Uh, but after she got settled in her housing, she wanted to do something else with her life and, and be useful. Oh, also, by the way, we found out her name, her real name was Laura. She had not really told us her real name. So we went from Liz to Laura. And now she's the uh, concession manager at the AMC 25 in Times Square. So think that this story is like what can happen when when things work in your world and when things work in the housing world you know there's lots and lots of Liz's that want to be Laura's out there um, so this is just statistically probably not as uh, meaningful as the Liz to Laura story but uh, we do go out and survey homeless people on the streets uh, it's something that we've built into our way of, of working. Uh, and 78% of the people on the streets do report that they struggle with some addiction. 46% um, report a mental illness. And then there's this other category called trimorbidity, which is any mental health diagnosis plus any substance abuse plus one chronic health condition like diabetes, cancer, heart disease, you know, that kind of, you know, big, bad, scary diseases. 24% 20, of people on the streets have all three of those at the same time. And their mortality is uh, incredibly high. It's about 25 years less than life expectancy of people who have housing. So what I, what I, can, what I dream of is that when I bring someone like Liz to one of your programs, that you can cure her. And when you have someone like Liz in one of your programs who doesn't have housing, you can bring her to me and we can house her. And like that these systems work. And I think for the most part, generally, uh, we have a really a high failure rate. And it's something I think we need to really work towards. It's a very aspirational goal. Um, and I also think that we can even look beyond the silos that have me in the housing world and you in the behavioral health world and look more broadly at what's going on. Um, and our work with the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, which is how uh, I met Tom and Scott, it, uh, has led us to think of housing really much more in the context of a determinant of health. Um, when, when we were asked to work with the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, they asked us, uh, you know, you have housing, why don't you come be part of this group that's trying to figure out how to reform healthcare? And I said, okay, well, we, we, I'd love to go to conferences, you know, but um, I don't know really what good we would do. And this doctor from the Mayo Clinic, he kind of, you know, chided me and he said, you know, all the debate in our society is around insurance right now. I mean, it's the only thing that's on the news right now, other than which beer did the president drink, right? And, like, it's all about uh, access to health care, access to health care. And I think that is a really important thing. But health care, even if, let's just say, forget access to health care. Health care only accounts per, for 10 percent of our health outcomes. So my perspective, I guess, as a taxpayer is we're arguing about the wrong stuff. We're arguing about something that's only 10% of the solution. Uh, whereas if you look at the things that make a difference between life or death for people, the biggest chunk of the pie by far is behavior, which is everyone in this room. Um, and then the other next big chunk is genetic, and there's not a whole lot we can do about that. But then the next big chunk after that is your social circumstance. So you're, whether you're housed, whether or not you have a job, your education level. So the doctor from the Mayo Clinic told me, he's like, hey, your housing, you're a bigger determinant of health than the whole healthcare industry. And I was like, all right. But I would say the same thing to everyone in this room. You're an even bigger chunk of health than that. And, and uh, I think we could do some really good stuff with this. Um, so as far as I'm concerned, um, um, anything that's on this slide is fair game. And the, the more we can think not in our silos of, I just do this, but if we think of ourselves as my job is to help people be healthy and help communities be healthy, then any of the things that make people healthy are fair game. And I think uh, our, our sandbox for creativity, for how we, can, how we can solve some of these really vexing problems. So, you know, uh, social networks are on here, education is on here, good, good rest, good uh, nutritious food, all these different things I think are things that can be leveraged to make people more healthy. So 
I want to kind of go back in time a little bit to uh, the story of Common Ground. I think that the organizational history can be, there's some useful lessons in there. Our mission now is to end homelessness by transforming people, buildings, and communities. But it started in uh, 1990 with this hotel. It's a, the picture on the left is the Times Square Hotel. Um, it was a large, large 650 units. And it was in such bad shape and such disrepair that when my boss, who was like 28 years old at the time, bought it, um, it the cleaning crews refused to go into some of the rooms. It was disgusting. Um, and at the time, it was like, hey, let's reclaim this property and let's make sure that homeless people can live here. Let's, let's end their homelessness with the housing here. And it was the largest it had ever been done at the time. Like, it had been done in maybe 30 units, but no one had ever attempted to do 650 units. Um, and now, those, those, uh, the picture on the right is what it looks like. It's much, much nicer. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's a bit of an improvement. In fact, here's a <laughs> understatement. Um, this is the lobby, and, and we really believe that, uh, the, that the physical landscape sort of affects the social landscape and that it's important to have nice places where people feel good about themselves for the workers and the people who live there. And uh, back in the uh, early 90s, I mean, it was kind of crazy. They inherited the people who lived there, and, you know, it was, it was a little nuts. And they literally went out on the streets and dragged people in and said, here's your new apartment. And it was the wild, wild west at the time. And, you know, I, I wasn't part of Common Ground, but the stories are just amazing. And one of the stories that I'd love to share with you uh, is just really awesome. Uh, my, my, it was like a small family business, and my boss, Roseanne Haggerty, kind of ran, ran the housing piece. And her sister, Mary Haggerty, um, worked with the tenants. So she was like more of a social, a social worker and tried to make a house a home for people. And there was one woman who slept outside across the street from the Times Square Hotel who was very, very old and had what Roseanne says the worst osteoporosis she's ever seen in her whole life. And every day she would drag a milk cart and she would just sit on this milk cart across the street from the hotel and she would never talk to anybody. And Mary Haggerty just made it her business to go reach out to this woman every single day and try to talk to her and find out what was going on and see if maybe she might be able to come live in the Times Square Hotel. And uh, to no avail. And one day the woman just wasn't there anymore. And a couple days later, Roseanne got a call from the hospital, from Bellevue Hospital, um, and asking for Mary because this woman had uh, gotten hospitalized. She'd gotten really sick, and she had named Mary as her next of kin. And um, so they, they were like, well, they went and visited her in the hospital, which is, I guess, the right thing to do. And she had, was, because of the, the assistance she had gotten and the medication she had, was able to have a very lucid conversation. And she wanted to come live in the Times Square Hotel. And that's what Mary wanted, too. And there was no paperwork to do that. There was no system that allowed someone living straight from the streets to move into supportive housing at the time. Um, so uh, Roseanne says that she, they, you know, they had a staff meeting, and they just said, screw it. We're moving her in. And uh, we, we just had a staff retreat this last week, and Roseanne said, I long for the days when you could just say, screw it. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and break the rules and go off the beaten path and get prickled by jumping cactuses. Um, but she just still does keep that spirit and energy alive at, at Common Ground. And so they did it. They just said, screw it. And when Sarah got discharged from the hospital, they brought her back to the Times Square. And as Roseanne tells the story, she's like, you would have thought Queen Elizabeth was showing up at the Times Square. The whole staff was lined up, and everyone was just like, you know, greeting her and so happy to have her there. And that's where... Um, that's, that was sort of the idealism with which Common Ground was founded, um, and, and it's a beautiful story. But then, because of the success of this stuff, the organization really grew, uh, grew by leaps and bounds. We now have 3,000 units of supportive housing in New York and development all over the country. Um, and the rent collection rate is over 99%. They evict less than one half of 1%. Uh, of the people who are there, and that's usually like really severe criminal activity if that happens. Uh, um, if you don't pay your rent, they'll work out a payment plan with you where like you pay back one dollar a month for the rest of your life. It's, but, but they, are, they have some stringent rules um, and really, really high standards. Um, and something kind of happens when you grow that way, like the Sarah Rayburns don't get in anymore, and you sort of stray from your idealism. 